can be heard. Um, if you turn the book of Titus this morning. Uh, last week we got started in a brand new book uh, for us in the book of Titus. And we laid the foundation of good works last week as we opened the book of Titus, uh, starting this study. And we saw that in the book of Titus, uh, we're finding uh, the theme, good works. Now, with that theme of good works, one thing that uh, we're trying to do here in the ministry at the church is to, uh, in the leadership, is perform more good works or better good works ourselves. And for that reason, uh, we provide you with a Sela card today. We hope everyone has one of those cards. It could be blue, it could be white, uh, but it's something for you to kind of keep with you throughout the service today. And we would like to know who you are and how to get in contact with you. I promise we're not going to spam you. We're not going to harass you. Uh, we just want to try to be a friend. And if you ever need anything, let you know that we are here for you. And I will say in response to the Sela cards that uh, due to my condition this past week and the visitors I had the week two weeks prior, I've been a little lax in this. So if you say, look, I filled all those out and haven't even heard from you, uh, I promise I'm going to get in touch with you real, real soon. Had every intention of doing that this week uh, just for one reason or another have been unable to do that. So we have those cards and those will be, you can drop those in a basket as you make your way out today. But here in Titus, we've uh, started the first nine verses. We laid the foundation of good works. And we saw that if there is going to be a, a good or a proper behavior, that has to be built upon a, a proper belief, a trust system. Uh, some people say it doesn't matter what you believe. It's just whatever you do. Well, one thing I can assure you is you are going to do based upon what you believe. Or how you think. Uh, all things are created twice. Before we act, we use, well, <laughs> most of the time, over 90% of the time, we think before we act. Now, uh, now we don't necessarily think so long sometimes uh, before we act. But nonetheless, that's one of the things that we have to work on as far as our belief goes. To give ourselves more time to act or react based upon the thoughts that we have. But to have the foundation of good works, that has to be built upon or predicated upon uh, truth. And we saw Paul laying that groundwork last week with his understudy, Titus. And we learned some interesting things about Titus, uh, none, not the least being that Titus was uh, used by Paul and uh, Barnabas when they went back to the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter number 15, Titus was actually an illustration for the Judaizers or for those who were pushing the idea you must be circumcised in the flesh to have faith in Christ. Titus as a Gentile was an uncircumcised believer that Paul says, look, God has given him faith in Jesus Christ, not because of anything he's done outwardly, but because of the faith he has in his heart. And that's important as we get in today's message, Faker, you busted. Okay? Uh, simple title today. If you're a faker, you're busted. Busted today. Uh, because uh, of what the Word of God is going to have to give to us here this morning. In verse... Number 10, 11, and 12, we find our first point of the message today. The Bible says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, and look at what Paul says here, especially they of the circumcision. Now, they're the ones who are supposed to have everything in order. They're the ones who are supposed to have all their I's dotted, their T's crossed, they're on their P's and Q's. Everything's perfect with them. They look the part. Everyone says, oh, they're the religious people. They're the ones who are close to God. But Paul says, look, their mouths must be stopped because they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not 
for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So here we have the ones who are preaching salvation comes by doing. Or salvation is a performance that you behave a particular way in front of people. So what these have done, they have twisted the truth. They twist the truth. They're fakers of good works. They show a hypocritical exterior appearance, but inside, like Christ said, they're full of dead men's bones. They're like whited sepulchers or graves that you make pretty on the outside, but inside there's nothing but rotting flesh and bones. As they twist the truth, they have the look. They look good. They wear the robes, they have special hats, they carry big Bibles, they recite long prayers, they do the things that everyone thinks, man, they are connected with Almighty God. You know, and even today it's sad that there are many who believe that there is a certain look to being a believer. Um, that's interesting because the Bible says that there are believers of every tribe, of every tongue, of every nation under planet Earth. And uh, we, we are a, a diverse people. Uh, one thing I love about our church right here is it is a church of diversity. It's a church of diversity, but even though we come from different backgrounds, even though we have different colors, different languages, uh, some of us dress different, our homes may look different, we eat different foods, we are unified in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the, the message that Paul is giving to Titus and the church at Crete. There at Crete, as the uh, island of Crete set in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean, it was, a, it was a transportation and a transit hub of commerce and ships coming in and out. So there were all kinds of people coming through there as well. My pastor was here a couple of weeks ago, and he's just amazed that this church, Believers Fellowship Baptist, has been in existence now for... Uh, about 30 months we've been in existence as a church, and in 30 months we've had visitors from about 30 different nations uh, on planet Earth. There have been people from all over the world that are passing through Moshi or coming through for the mountain or for tourism or for education or for medical things or volunteering or for some reason they're coming through and God is bringing the nations here. Uh, sometimes, you know, today we, we have maybe about 30, 40 people, but sometimes we have over 100. It's, just, it's amazing how that at different stages of the year, who God brings through here. Some people we've seen exercise faith in Jesus Christ. Others we've seen baptized uh, into Jesus' uh, name. Others we've seen growing in their faith, encouraged to continue or uh, learning biblical truth. So the look... It, while some think there's a certain look to Christianity, there's nothing further from the truth. Uh, Christianity is not a look, it's a life in Jesus Christ. And so these had the look, but they were twisting the truth. And what they were doing with the look is they were hoarding the lucre. He said they were serving <coughs> and they were swaying people, teaching things what they sh which they shouldn't. Why? For monetary gain. For personal profit. That was, sadly, that was their motivation. Now, should a servant of the gospel reap benefit? Yes. Should that be his or her primary motivation? No. It's a fringe benefit. It's something that just comes, okay? Um, 
And while we're on this subject, I'd like to say I've mentioned before, I receive no salary from this church. I, I don't I don't even get an offering. I I give my tithe here. I don't get it. Financially, I don't get out of it. I'm giving into it. Uh, just like you are. And that's why I'm comfortable asking you to give because I know that I give. Again, when I started this church, I talked to my pastor. Uh, before I started the English ministry, it was always uh, Swahili churches. And when I was in Swahili churches, I chose to keep my tithe back at my sending church in Tanzania. And the reason for that is I didn't want a large discrepancy in what pastor's giving and what the people are giving. Okay, I didn't want the church to become dependent upon my tithe as a source of income for that church. So my tithe always stayed at Mamre Baptist in Ohio. Well, when I started this church, I knew there would be a different dynamic. I knew that we were going to be reaching out to people of a different economic level. And because of that, I told my pastor, I want to tithe into the English-speaking church. And he said, fine. And so now my tithe off of my financial income goes into this church. Now, if you're sitting there wondering about tithing and all that, we've talked about in the church before, okay? Uh, we are not legalistic tithers. I just think it's a good place to start if you're a Christian in the New Testament. I mean, if you're commanded to give 10% in the Old Testament, uh, I don't think that we should give any less in the New Testament. If anything, we should give more, okay? So it's a good place to start. If you haven't ever tithed and you're a Christian, you should at least start there. I call it kindergarten giving. It's kind of like the preschool. That's where you start, but surely you shouldn't stop there. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we also give above and beyond uh, the time. Uh, so that's something all Christians should do. So what are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm just trying to say that this church, we didn't start with a desire to reap financial benefit. Okay? Uh, have we reaped any? Maybe a little bit here and there. Uh, but whatever we've reaped has gone right back into this ministry. And that's what we anticipate will continue to happen. And as we pray and as we give and as we go forward, and as right now we've moved to here for this Sunday, uh, we continue to see tithes and offerings given and the budget to grow so that possibly someday in the future, this church will even be in a different location, in another building. Who knows? Uh, but we're just going to be all that we, all that God wants to be. Hold on to the truth, not twist it, not be concerned with the look, not hoard the lucre, but use it for God's glory. And because these have the look and they hoard lucre, they hurl lies. In verse 12... He said, even one of themselves, one of these circum, of the circumcision, who lives in Crete, he says the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now look at what this says here. One of them themselves, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own. So here's a Cretan saying what? I'm a liar, I'm an evil beast, I'm a slow belly. I mean, it's one of their own, you know, saying those things. So they hurl lies and they pour condemnation upon themselves. So be very careful about those who may look the part, those who might even appear very flashy in the world. Be very careful that they're not throwing out lies. Be very careful that they're staying true to the Scriptures and not their own imaginations or their own thoughts or their own desires. So these twist the truth. And then Paul continues in verse 13, says, This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So they twist the truth and they also turn from the truth. That is a definite rejection of what is right. Truth is the standard for our faith. Okay? 
Again, there's a big movement today about faith. People say, have faith, believe, trust. Oh, do the, but sometimes when people are talking about have faith, my question is, have faith in what? Okay? Because some just think you should have faith in faith. <laughs> well, faith in faith isn't going to get you anywhere. Okay? Because faith uh, is, is, uh, is the thought that is placed upon an object. Okay? So the faith must have an object. What's the object of faith? Jesus Christ said, I am the, tr the way, the truth, and the life. He also said in his prayer to the Heavenly Father, which I like to call the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, sanctify them, set them apart, he prays to the Father, through your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. But Jesus Christ is true and is truth as He is understood through the revealed Word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So these turn from the truth. They turn from what? They turn from the revealed Word of God. That's truth. Right there. You can take this to the bank every day of the week and twice on Sunday if the bank's open, okay? Uh, this is truth. It's God's Word. It is settled. It is complete. It is factual. It is unfailing. It has no error. It will keep you sound in the faith. Okay, these are unsound in the faith because they have turned from the truth of the Word of God. Some of them don't receive the total revelation, like these uh, of the circumcision. They were holding to the law of Moses, not wanting to enter into the new covenant, the New Testament, which was found in Jesus Christ. So they were not receiving the... New Testament revelation. Today, we have a lot of people who are wanting to add to the New Testament revelation. Now, there, that just opens up a chaotic series of events. Because either the Word of God is complete, or it's not complete. And if it's not complete, we then have to go through a, a process of asking ourselves, now what criteria do we need to set in order for new revelation to be received? Okay, Because there's no former revelation in the Old Testament or the New Testament that was not received based upon a criteria, based upon a soundness of truth and verifiable documentation, this is the Word of God. But today, we have a lot of people saying they have the Word of God. And they just say, God gave me Word, they spout it out, but it doesn't line up with Scripture. Who's right? Who's wrong? There's, there, there, lies, there lies a conundrum. And how many of these can be correct? Well, thankfully God gave us in the Revelation a word that says, if any man adds to the prophecies of this book, let him be accursed. If any man takes away from the prophecies of this book, let these, let these uh, curses be added unto him or her. So, we must say that if God's word is not complete, as we believe that it is, 66 books from Genesis to Revelation, then who is qualified? Who's qualified now to add to it? Well, that makes a lot of people unsound in their faith. And because of them being unsound in faith, they school in fables. Words. Uh, stories that they think of of their own self and their own design. They school in fables and they're set on fathers, meaning that they take the words of men over the word of God. Taking the word of men over the word of God, adding to 
uh, building upon and actually taking more stock in the word of men, in the word of the fathers, than in the written, revealed word of God. Okay? Verse number 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So the, the plight, the decline is this. First, they twist the truth. After twisting the truth, they turn from the truth. And when you turn from the truth, the only uh, ending place you're going to find is that they now taint the truth. The Bible says that if you're pure, all things are pure. But if you're defiled and unbelieving, there's nothing pure. So these who twist and who turn from the truth, they now are laying a, a filthy foundation, an unsure and unsound foundation of faith that is going to crumble under the pressure. And because they take the truth, this leads to filthy minds. It means it leads to a pollution of the thought process because the foundation hasn't been laid, it hasn't been secured. So now the thinking, the conscience is defiled and the mind. And so what happens is when you hear a lie, you think it's the truth. And you can't differentiate what's true, what's error, what's right, what's wrong. And everything gets cloudy and it gets all muddled. And so there begins to be a, a, syn a syncretism within the thought process where we can marry that which is true and that which is an error. And this brings a, a pollution of truth in the, in the play. Okay? And then when things... Okay, we'll follow through. So what happens there? After the mind becomes complete, polluted, then the lives begin to be destructed. Because the behavior, remember, is going to be built upon the belief. The behavior is going to be built upon what someone is thinking. So a filthy mind will lead to a faulty life. It will lead to a destruction of faith. Okay? Because once the life is gone then the hope fails. See, there have been some teachers, some preachers, some religious leaders who have given great hope to people. They've told them, if you do A, B, C, you will get X, Y, Z. And if you don't, then the problem is you. See? You must follow this prescribed plan. And they give them a criteria to follow to be blessed. And if someone doesn't get blessed because they did these things, then they begin to wonder, what did I do to mess up? Okay. Paul says, listen, it's grace. It's not you. It's grace. It's the foundation of Jesus Christ and what He has done. It's the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie has promised acknowledging the truth which is after godliness. And God promised it before the world began He said in chapter number 1 your hope is steadfast and it's sure and it's an anchor if it is in truth. If it's in the proper place. Otherwise, you're going to be sailing on unsound waters and you're going to crash. You're going to make shipwreck of your faith. See, don't put your faith in men. Don't put your faith in some tremendous speaker or someone maybe who says they've seen a vision or someone who's done something extraordinary that you think. Don't put your faith in that person. Don't put your faith in that movement. Put your faith and leave it in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Because He is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You change, I 
change. He stays the same. See, keep your anchor in the sure place, which is Christ. And the hope that will never fail you, and the hope that we preach at this church, is this. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've recognized your sin, if you acknowledge His death upon the cross, His burial, His resurrection is sufficient for your salvation, then you, I can tell you, based upon the authority of God's Word, have received eternal life. And that is a hope that never fails. That is a hope that you can hang on to even at your last dying breath. But the hope that says you need to do, you need to act, you need to behave, you need to fulfill these orders, you will go to the end of your life wondering, did I do enough? Did I meet the standard? See, the thing about faith in Christ, the standard was met not by you, not by me. The standard was met by Him on the cross. Amen. It was met by Him when He rose up from the grave. And that is the hope that we possess in Christ. And you say, well, Pastor Greg, what about, what about life? I mean, what about just living? What about being blessed? What do I do about you build it all upon the truth. Okay? First of all, you build it on the and you build upon that lasting hope. And when you have an eternal perspective, when you see the overarching sovereignty of God, His control, and His grace over everything you do and everything that's happening to you, then you can have peace of mind in Him. You can have understanding. That God is in control of this whole thing. And He knows what's best. You can cling to the promise of whatever happens, whether it be good or bad, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. That you're here for His purpose, you're here for His plan, and you're here based upon His hope. Well, today... As we talk about the fakers being 